rotten sticks in the back of the same, which caused the eyes to move and stir in their head thereof. The discovery of wires in the Rood of Grace by Geoffrey Chamber exposed it as a temple machine. It was engineered by an unknown English carpenter and operated by a hidden monk. Exactly how the monks manipulated the mechanism is not clear. The physical evidence was destroyed. We can speculate that the head of the figure was pivoted at the back, the eyes moved by wires so they appeared to open, and the lower lip attached with a simple leather hinge that also operated with a wire to simulate speech. What happened to the Rood of Grace is that it was taken down and it was exhibited in various places in Kent and then finally in London. The reason for this was London was already the biggest city in the world. The exposure of the miracle as a mechanical fraud served Henry well. The whole deal with the Rood of Boxley, the Rood of Grace, is that it's one of the showpieces of Henry VIII's Reformation. It's paraded around London, it's shown off the royal court, and finally it's ceremonially burned. And it's used as their biggest single exhibit to prove that the old church was full of trickery and fraud. Why did the monks do it? Was it a technological extension of the wall paintings and statues that encouraged the faithful in their devotions? Or was it a cynical money-making ploy to bring in gullible pilgrims? We shall probably never know. Our next ancient discovery involves a bitter struggle between two world religions. We investigate a religious secret society that brought the art of war to the service of God and its own survival. Ancient Discoveries has investigated the use of technology and engineering to reinforce the faith of religious believers. Now we will examine how faith inspired new technology to combat its enemies. In the early Middle Ages, the Order of St. John was founded in Jerusalem to care for sick pilgrims. By 1530, they were installed on the Mediterranean island of Malta. Part monk, part soldier, the Knights of Malta dedicated themselves to the spiritual and military defense of Christianity. The order is unique because it did start as a monastic order with the, the individuals taking the vows, the monastic vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience and it grew into a warrior order as well to defend the faith. The Knights of St. John were in a religious and military conflict with an Islamic empire that threatened to overrun the whole of the Mediterranean. In 1565, on the island of Malta, they faced annihilation from an invading force sent by the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. By the time the Ottomans have got their army ashore, there are at least 25,000 soldiers and possibly 10,000 more men from the navy who can be used if necessary. The Christians have around 500 knights, 3,000 mercenaries, probably another 3,500 Maltese militia. The order was outnumbered four to one. If we look at the raw numbers, it might seem that the knights must have been supermen. They took on defeated four times their number of Ottoman troops. Not any old Ottoman troops, but the very best household troops of the most powerful man on earth. How did the knights overcome these overwhelming odds? Prayer and faith doubtlessly inspired their immense courage and resourcefulness. They planned for a four-week siege, and of course it went on for nearly as many months, with appalling casualties. The order was going to survive by the will of God, or it was going to perish there on Malta. The Ottoman Armada of 190 ships was one of the largest invasion forces assembled since antiquity. The thoughts of any knight seeing that huge armada descend on water when the Grand Master of the time, Lavalette, had tried for, for years to persuade Europe that this was going to happen and no aid had come. It was a small force and we thought, how could we possibly survive this? The order combined one of man's oldest resources with technology to succeed in battle. Throughout the history of warfare, men have constantly tried to find ways of harnessing fire, the most deadly element known to primitive man, a way of getting into the primeval psyche of the human. 
And the Knights of St. John, like the Greeks of Byzantium, like the ancient Greeks, and in the 20th century, flamethrowers and napalm, they found a way of harnessing fire for military purposes. Andrew has come to Malta's National Library, home to precious documents of the order dating back to before the Great Siege. He has unearthed a text that could reveal evidence of the knight's fabled fire weapon. This is the Balbi manuscript. This is the original first-hand account of the Siege of Malta, written by a man who was there in the first person, printed only a few years after the battle finished. This is the most important single account of the Siege of Malta. The text vividly describes the terrifying destruction wrought by Turkish artillery during the Great Siege. One of the things Balbi does is, here at page 39, he describes how when the Turks commenced their bombardment during the night of St. Elmo, the fireworks being thrown up by both sides were so luminous that they turned night into day. Buried in the account is a description of a devastating weapon deployed by the knights. It was called a trump, an old name for a trumpet. It was a flamethrower that discharged a sheet of fire upon the attackers as they swarmed up the walls. It sometimes incorporated a device which fired a number of bullets. Alby tells us how the trumps work, and he gives us a great opportunity to try and replicate those results. Do these things do on test what Balby tells us they do at Fort St. Elmo? In the United Kingdom, historic gunsmith Ian Hen is taking up the challenge of recreating the military technology of the Knights. He is attempting to build and fire the flamethrower Balby describes. Using sheet iron rolled into a tube, Ian is producing a large version of the trump that is 12 feet in length. The metal is heated to over a thousand degrees and then shaped into its trumpet-like design. We can estimate how effective it would have been, but we can't really tell until it's gone through a proper test firing. At a disused stone quarry, Ian has come to put the knight's 16th century flamethrower to the test. We'll be using modern blasting gun powder, very similar to the powder they would have used in the siege of Malta. Uh, they had what was known as corn powder, which had been in existence for about 150 years by then and it's very similar to modern black powder. Ian's first test will examine its capability as a flamethrower. The gunpowder charge is loaded into the muzzle and then ignited with a burning fuse. Give me fire! The first test demonstrates that at short range, the trunk could be lethal. What we've just seen is a highly efficient, early modern flamethrower. Remember, the enemy are wearing long flowing silk robes. They're going to burn just like this. It's a highly effective way of stopping an attack. The last thing these guys are going to be thinking about is carrying on and breaking through into the defenses. They're going to want to put these clothes out. They're going to want to stop burning. What makes the trump an even more effective weapon is its reported ability to attack the enemy in two stages. After the flame shoots out, the texts recount that projectiles were fired. This was done by placing a second charge of gunpowder at the back of the iron chamber and loading it with projectiles. Ian is setting up the trump to replicate this. First, the team will fire the flame from the front of the muzzle. They will then ignite the second stage charge via the touch hole at the back of the trump shooting out small stones and shards of metal at the target. Giving fire! How the care! There's a lot of flame, a lot of smoke, a lot of noise, not once but twice. So you can be set on fire, you can be shot. And at night, with these large flashes and flares, it's going to be a really frightening thing to be coming up against. The tests confirm that the Trump would have been an effective close-range firearm against besiegers, attempting to breach castle walls, and would have performed exactly how the Balbi text describes it. It combines a terrifying stream of fire with a deadly hail of shot. But the Trump is not the only extraordinary weapon mentioned by Balbi in his account of the siege. The ancient manuscript tells us about an even deadlier secret weapon, 
one that helped the Knights of St. John secure their extraordinary victory. In 1565, on the Mediterranean island of Malta, a religious order of warrior monks called the Knights of St. John was under siege by a force four times its size, sent by the Ottoman Emperor Suleiman the Magnificent. The extraordinary victory of the Knights in their holy war was partly due to the development of terrifying weapons. The mysterious arts of the armorers of the Knights of Malta are being investigated by historian Andrew Lambert. He starts at Fort St. Elmo, where the siege began. Out here we can see just where the Turkish galleys would have been, forming up under oars, ready to bombard the castle. And there would have been dozens of them, each one with two or three cannon facing forward, a continuous rain of fire on the seaward side of Fort St. Elmo. Throughout June and July of 1565, fighting was intense. Both sides were merciless, and thousands of soldiers were killed. When the Ottomans capture some knights, they crucify them in a mockery of the crucifixion of Christ and then float them across the harbor to try and intimidate the knights into surrendering. The knights respond by beheading their Turkish prisoners, which is again blasphemous, and firing their heads back into the Turkish camp. There's no quarter expected. This is life and death, and the losers will die. The knights had to play for time. If they could hold out until the winter, the Turks would have to return home. Until then, they needed every possible device and stratagem to keep the Turks at bay. One of the devices described in the ancient texts is known as the fire hoop. For the defenders of St. Elmo, this was the crisis. Under constant artillery bombardment, the men standing at the parapet would have been cowering below under heavy artillery fire, constantly being sniped at with muskets. They'd have brought the hoops blazing, one man on each side with long iron tongs. And the trick was to flick them over the top and get them rolling down onto the Turkish infantry as they stormed up the assault bridge. They often refer to as firework hoops. Uh, and they were, in fact, smeared in linseed oil uh, with wool and gunpowder. And the idea was that these were like gigantic Catherine wheels spinning through the air. Because of what is on those hoops, we have a sticky, burning mass that is almost impossible to put out. How would this unlikely weapon work in practice? What was so innovative about the hoop? Could it really give defenders a decisive advantage against a mass assault of determined warriors with ladders and siege engines? These are questions ancient technology expert Richard Windley is attempting to answer using the same materials described in the Balbi manuscript. So basically we've got a large hoop we bind it with wool and cotton, and these are then be soaked in flammable oils. And then over the top of that, we start to bind material, something like coarse hessian or any old material which is, um, which is going spare will do the trick. This is then bound round very tightly and held on with wire, and then it was dipped in molten pitch. They also use flammable compounds. The flammable compound Richard is using consists of natural oils and waxes, animal fat and gunpowder, ingredients available to the knights during the siege. This was a highly secret formula in the Middle Ages and was applied to the iron hoops usually used to make barrels. Because I don't know what's going to happen, I'm going to pop the goggles on just for safety and, uh, and light it and uh, we'll see what happens. Well, that seems to be burning for quite a prolonged period. And what's interesting is we can actually see the molten pitch dripping off. Now, when I actually applied the pitch to this, I got one or two spots on my hand. It is very, very nasty. And it, if you get any quantity on you, it adheres to the skin and it produces very, very nasty burns. After successfully testing the flammable material, Richard will try out the hoops. At the bottom of the cliff face, a set of targets has been set up to represent the Turkish troops in the